Good evening and uh, welcome to Intellectual Publics. Coming to you from the Graduate Center at CUNY in New York City. I'm Ken Whisaker, director of the program. And we're in for a very special conversation this evening between Dr. Sammy Schock and Vilesa Thompson around the topic of Professor Schock's new book, Black Disability Politics. You may have heard about it on NPR or read about it in essence. This is a needed and historic call to put Black health central while at the same time pointing out how disability concerns have really never been far from Black politics and organizing efforts. It's a call for disability justice, a tracing of actions going back to the 1970s, and a vision forward. We are very fortunate to have Dr. Schock in conversation with Blylissa Thompson, one of the activists hailed in the book, and to have signing from Brandon Kaysen Maddox and Juana Aguilar. I just want to pause for a moment to honor the memory of Judy Hyman, who passed away uh, this past week. And then I want to uh, thank Chelsea Largent for all the work in helping this evening to happen. And to remind you, if you have questions, to please put them in the Q&A. Uh, the chat will be open, uh, but we'd really prefer to see the questions in the Q&A so we can sort them out. Dr. Sammy Schock is an Associate Professor of Gender and Women's Studies at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She's the author of Body, Mind, Reimagined, Disability, Race, and Gender in Black Women's Speculative Fiction, which came out from Duke in 2018, and Black Disability Politics, uh, which came out from Duke at the end of last year. Dr. Schock's academic work focuses on race, disability, and gender in contemporary American literature and culture. She also writes for mainstream outlets, including a monthly column called Pleasure Practices in Tone Madison. Dr. Schock identifies as a flat, black, queer, disabled femme, and a pleasure activist. Vilissa Thompson is a licensed master of social work from Winsboro, South Carolina. Vilissa is the founder and CEO of Ramp Your Voice, an organization focused on pro promoting self-advocacy and strengthening empowerment among disabled peoples. Being, being a disability rights consultant, writer and activist affords Vilissa the opportunity to be a prominent leader an expert in addressing and educating the public and political figures about the plight of disabled people, especially Black women and femmes with disabilities. Ramp Your Voice is her organization where she discusses the issues that matter to her as a Black disabled woman, including intersectionality, racism, politics, and why she unapologetically makes good trouble. She has been featured in essence for its Black history now 2019 series and its Woke 100 Women 2018 list, spoke about her entrepreneurship and activism work for Forbes, invited to be a panelist for Know Her Truths conference at Wake Forest, and invited to be a keynote speaker at Purdue University for its focus of awards, and written or appeared in many prominent publications, including Vogue, CNN, MTV, The New York Times, uh, Huffington Post, and BuzzFeed. Brandon Kaysen Maddox, they them, is a grandchild of deaf adults and a third generation native signer of American Sign Language, who identifies as non-binary, black indigenous person of color, and a member of the LGBTQAI plus community. Brandon is an artist, choreographer, director, actor, acrobat, activist, and ASL artist and performer. Brandon has also spent the last 10 years as a professional ASL interpreter. Brandon creates work with and for the deaf and disability communities and highlights and empowers BIPOC and LGBTQAI plus artists, building bridges of collaboration and community among people of all backgrounds and abilities. In the summer of 2020, Brandon co-founded Up Until Now Collective, an arts and media company that focuses on developing and producing radically inclusive 
interdisciplinary work. Up until now, projects include Soul Signs, an ASL playlist, um, a series of 10 ASL music videos for broadstream media featuring iconic songs by Black women, featured in the New York Times, on ABC World News, and as the midnight moment in Times Square appearing on 80 screens every night at midnight back in July of 2021. Soul Signs Opera, a series of opera ASL videos commissioned by Boston Lyric Opera, and Pride video campaigns for Amazon Music and Global Citizen. Brandon's work as an interpreter and activist has been profiled on CNN, and they've appeared as a co-star on The Good Fight on Paramount Plus and High Maintenance on HBO. Brandon was also a featured storyteller on the 100th episode of Stories from the Stage on PBS, and they were chosen as one of Gucci and Time for Change's 22 for 22 Visions for a Feminist Future. They're joined tonight by Juana Aguilar, an Afro-Latina native New Yorker. After uh, her graduation from LaGuardia Community College's interpreting program, she has continued to pursue her passion in interpreting in a variety of settings, ranging from medical, community work, and the arts. She has immersed herself in theater arts, interpreting, theater arts interpreting, sorry, and thrives in environments where BIPOC talents are highlighted. When Juana isn't working, she can be found home with her five fur babies or trying out new good eats in town. Uh, and we're very, very happy to have all of them joining us tonight. I think this is going to be really, really special. And I'm going to uh, get out of here and turn it over to them. Thanks, Ken. Yes, thank you for those warm introductions. Um, you want to start with some image descriptions, friend? Yes. Cool. Um, I'll go first. I am Valissa. I am a light-skinned Black woman who is sitting in her wheelchair. I am wearing a light blue long sleeve shirt, red regular shaped glasses. My dark brown hair is hanging down. Have on a um, neutral color lip, and my background is a sunny yellow. And I am also a light-skinned Black woman with short curly hair and pink to purple ombre glasses, uh, lacy, let's call this like magenta-ish shirt on. And behind me, there's a bookshelf um, with two large posters of each of my books, as well as a picture of a Black woman wearing a dress made out of newspaper. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for agreeing to be in conversation with me. It's always a joy to spend time with you. And so I'm happy to be doing this. Um, do you want to start with just like telling folks who we are and how we got to this point uh, in what we're doing in terms of our lives as, you know, public intellectuals and doing the work? Yes. Um... For me, this was not the path I had dreamed <laughs> at all. Um, when I went to grad school for social work, I had wanted to be a therapist. Uh, and in grad school is where I learned about macro social work. And that is dealing with communities and dealing with advocacy. And that's where I realized, wow, I can do more than just the stereotypical things that people know of social workers, which is you know, working with clients, doing case management, and so forth. So, you know, right after graduation in 2012, I still thinking about doing micro social work, those traditional social work jobs. But then I started to do blogging and writing about social work and disability. And in 2013, that's when I created Ramp Your Voice as my own space to talk about things that matter to me you know it was my way of talking about highlighting issues that I saw it was my way of creating a space in the community a lot of us were starting to be online around that time in the 2010s and just meeting other folks from different parts of the country and the world and it just really allowed me to see that there's a lot out there so coming to this space now 10 years is what I'm celebrating this year 
the evolution just blows my mind at times, you know, as to how much the space has grown, how much I have grown, you know, from being in my mid twenties and not being in my, you know, mid to late thirties now, you know, just really seeing the evolution of the times. Um, you know, one thing I always tell people is that public speaking was not on my radar <laughs> to do this. You would have told me 10 years ago, I would be talking in front of different spaces. I'm like, no, that's not what I do. But being in this work has allowed me to be pushed into arenas that felt, you know, very different, but also felt good at the same time. It's like, why not me? So, and I think that's a little bit of my work. Like, why not me? Why not me being in this time and space? And also fill in the gaps that's needed. You know, when we, I'm sure you have a similar story of coming to the space, it wasn't that many of us, you know, of color, you know, in these spaces, particularly Black films talking about these things. So to see this burst of energy, burst of color, you know, has been the most exciting part and energizing as well. So, you know, this is a path that has become a calling of sorts. Um, that feels right and still evolving, you know, and I hope that 10 years from now, I'll be doing many other different things. But right now, this feels like the right thing for me to be doing and sharing space with you. And, you know, we're not just colleagues, but, you know, we're also friends. So just really having this friendship, you know, evolving. I think that's kind of where I am, just seeing the evolution of things and being open to them as well. Yeah. Thank you. I actually have not heard you talk about how you ended up doing Ramp Your Voice. I mean, that's when I first became aware of you was probably maybe 2014, 2015. Yes. Very early. Yeah. Um, And even then only from, you know, a Twitter distance. (laughs) Um, Let's see. How did I get here? I was 19 at college and I was a women's studies major and there was a class called women in disability that fit my schedule counted as an elective credit I was like great sounds good you know I I had no idea um I just took it as you do you just take a class that Mm -hmm. fulfills whatever you need to be fulfilling as you go through college um and I had come out as queer to friends at that point not to everybody yet but um, to friends was under quickly understanding myself as a as a queer woman black queer woman and so I kind of felt like oh I know everything there is to know about oppression this class is going to be easy um, my cat just walked on screen and will yes. probably jump up on the back of my chair at some point just a heads up <laughs> um, so I took this class and it blew my mind like just fireworks going off in my brain everything we were reading, I was just devouring it. It was so fascinating to me that I had spent so much time thinking about race and gender and class and sexuality. And I had just not been thinking about disability with the same critical lens. And I realized that if I was going to keep as we do in our early activist days, mostly just like yelling at white people and men and being like, you need to recognize your privilege. Yes. If I was going to do that, I had to like grapple with my own privilege within the disability system because at the time I didn't understand myself as disabled and we Mm -hmm. can, you know, talk more about our journeys to that. Um, So I just invested. I took every class I could every class in disability studies. Um, I just read a ton of things. And um, when I graduated, I went to the Society for Disability Studies Conference. Um, My mentor, Kathy McMahon, M-C-M-A-H-O-N, Klosterman, K-L-O-S-T-E-R-M-A-N, who I love and adore forever. She's like my academic mom. Uh, welcome to the stage, Madam Alice. This is my cat. This is the true diva likes. of tonight. Every time I am on a Zoom call, she just <laughs> has to do this. Um, 
so she took me to this conference as kind of a co-presenter on something that she was presenting on. And um, I went there and the field of disability studies just felt so alive. Everyone that I was reading, all the books that were blowing my mind, those people were there. They were sitting next to me at lunch and sitting in front of me at panels. And it felt incredible to be a part of this just rich intellectual community that also included activists, right? Early disability studies was a little bit of everything. Mm -hmm. And so it just was so much more exciting to me than all of my English stuff where we were reading old dead white people. Um, And I just, I wanted more. And so I leaned into it. And the more that I got into the field of disability studies, very quickly, I realized, oh, this is very white. (laughs) It's very, very white. Um, You know, people would ask me to review papers when I was a grad student, you know, I was like, I don't have the qualifications for this, but there was just not a lot of folks of color, not a lot of people talking about race and disability in the field. And so I was being given a lot of opportunities super early on just because there weren't other people. Um, And so that's how I got into it. You know, I just had a lot of support from people in the field. And I like to acknowledge that because I'm super critical (laughs) of disability studies. You know, I really am. Um, And some of the early founders of the field really held and supported me in such important ways and made me feel like what I had to say and what I was thinking through at 2021 was valuable and was important. I should keep doing it. And so I did, you know, um, for me, the, the impulse was really wanting to understand why black feminist theory, which I thought and continue to think is always at the forefront of innovation and thinking and political organizing and theory. And I couldn't figure out why disability wasn't in there, why Mm -hmm. I couldn't find it in the books not in the explicit way I wanted, right? I, it right. was there. You know, we were reading Audre Lorde's cancer journals in a, in my Black Feminist Theory class. We were reading articles about Black women in lupus, but there wasn't that critical political lens. And so I just became invested in making that happen, you know, being a bridge, bringing those fields together. Um, and then I've just been on that journey ever since um, with the first book and now with the second book. And yeah, the second book and interviewing is how we came into like direct contact and became actual friends instead of, you know, passing internet acquaintances. (laughs) Um, Exactly. Yeah. So that was 2019. I interviewed a lot of stuff, a lot of folks from the Harriet Tubman Collective, and you were one of them. And we just had a great conversation. And I felt like I learned a lot from you and a lot from everyone that I interviewed. And those interviews, the, that was a place where I finally was like, I think I need to spend some time grappling with my relationship to disability identity. You know, I really need to think about it because it was a question that I was asking everybody about what's the role of this? Do we need to claim disability? Why do people not claim disability? Mm-hmm. And it was just so helpful for me to be in conversation with Black disabled people, you know, yes. with people that would say, we're not forcing anybody to do anything. And here's all the reasons why people don't, and it's okay. And you can take your time. And Mm -hmm. that approach was so different than some of the people that I encountered in disability (laughs) studies. You know, I had white people that were like, well, just tell me when you finally identify as disabled. And it just felt so condescending, you know? Yeah. Um, Because, you know, there was a part of me that knew just like there was a part of me that knew I was queer right before I was ready to say I was queer. We can't force people into this space of identity. Um, yeah. Do you want to say a little bit about how you came into disability identity and disability community? Because I think people assume if you have a congenital disability, if you're disabled from birth, right? If you have a visible disability, that it's automatic, mm-hmm. but it's not. <laughs> no, it is not. And it's funny, like hearing your story, it made me think about, you know, when I was in undergrad, I intentionally minored in ethnic studies to have a more robust understanding of Black history. Because I felt like in hearing you, I'm like, you know, we had like the opposite effect. And, you know, being from South Carolina, you know, my grandmother was of the solid generation. 
I heard all her stories about having to walk to school and dealing with, you know, she's her and her friends walking to school and the white kids will yell out, you know, yell out to them on the bus and spit at them and things of that nature. So it wasn't like I didn't understand what it meant to be a Black person under Jim Crow or, you know, the importance of voting. Like when I turned 18, getting my voting card was the most exciting thing ever, you know. Um, you know, but I knew I wanted to know more about my history. Like that was just so important to me. And, you know, and it made me feel very empowered. A little bit how you was talking about what all these things learning for you, like learning about Black history in a very intentional way empowered me. And, and this is somebody who grew up in a predominantly Black school district. So it's not like I wasn't familiar, but getting to the deeper points of learning about African politics, learning about, you know, African-American politics, like why we vote the way that we do, like all of these instrumental things that make us who we are as a people, you know, I was able to study that in depth. So, you know, coming into this space to where Blackness was kind of treated as like a second class of sorts, you know, it was like, whoa, hold up here, you know, because I am a Black person, particularly I'm from South Carolina, like, that's what people see, mm -hmm. you know, so I cannot, you know, downplay what people see on the outside here, you know, just to make you comfortable. And I think that having that type of studying really empowered me to be secure in my Blackness. You know, similar to you, you're meeting white disabled folks who, you know, have their whiteness, you know, blaring sometimes and not really understanding that this is not all that we're dealing with here. So come to this space. And then, you know, as I began my online advocacy, meeting other Black women who later identified as disabled, you know, doing this work, talking about Black feminism and womanism, like learning about womanism was amazing because I never felt that connected to feminism. You know, like, you know, I have a lot of white women friends. They love feminism. I'm like, what does that have to do with me as a Black woman? So and finding out about womanism, I'm like, wow, that is something that's, you know, the FUBU mindset for us, by us, you know? And I was like, wow, this is what I can resonate into. And I can fit my disability perspective into that more easily. That feminism, when I learned that feminism was not inclusive of always of disabled um, people, particularly disabled women in films. So I'm like, oh, this feels more into the way. So coming into the online space, you know, just reinforcing reinforce not just my Black identity or what I want to talk about, but also how to bridge these communities together. You know, being Black, being woman, femme, and disabled, you know, that was my educating and learning into the space and really gave me the courage to really talk about these things with intention and to not be forced to pick a side because there is no picking up sides here. And it made me go back into kind of the question you asked me about disability story, I've been disabled my whole life, you know, since utero, you know, and that has never, this has never been an identity. You know, people care about my disability for the medicalized reasons. You know, I have a brittle bone disorder. So people care about the surgeries that I've had. You know, if I did break a bone, going to the hospital, like everything that dealt with my disability was about my care, how to make sure I care for myself, you know. And growing up in that space, I saw that my Black was highlighted, you know, being in a very Black family, you know, who was very open about the history here in our small town and their experiences, going to predominantly Black school district, you know, that was very nurtured, but disability was not. And I think that as I look back, I just thought that was true for all of us. You know, in my family, it's just me and my other cousin who has an intellectual disability, who is about maybe 10, 12 years older than myself. And so I saw the differences in bet between how folks sometimes treated me versus her. So I understood it was like this unspokenness about, you know, the hierarchy of disability, but I didn't have the language then. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, in an article that I published this month, you know, I saw the way that teachers talked about those who were, uh, who had intellectual disabilities, developmental disabilities, or may have been non-speaking. 
And again, that friction there that adults who should know better create for us. So the disability aspect of me was always separate. You know, I was, you know, I'm known still in my hometown as the smart disabled girl. You know, that is my title, the smart one. You know, I was valedictorian, so I was really a nerd. So it's not like it's far fetched. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, that's my role, you know, and I was treated a certain way. Like people had high expectations, you know, and I met them. And it's weird for people to have high expectations, but also you realize they don't really know what to expect from you. You know, like you're one of the, it's always the first to do stuff to where, People didn't discourage me, but I also knew that they didn't know what I could do. So it was just me kind of meeting the benchmarks for myself, you know, things I want to do. Like, you know, a lot of stories we hear in the community, folks, you know, talk about their families and teachers discouraging them from going to college and things of that nature. I never had that experience. And my grandmother, I don't think she knew what life had for me, but she knew it was her job to support that. And I think that's one of the greatest gifts that she gave me as a disabled young person is that whatever you want to do, as long as you're safe and you're not doing anything illegal, I'm here for. <laughs> you know, like I raise you well, I trust you and so forth. So, you know, I understood that with that kind of separate identity, folks still gave me space to be. You know, so it's just a very, you know, as I've gotten older, very weird situation to kind of be in to where people don't know what to expect, but they see your potential. They see the things that, you know, make you you. So they're just going to let you do your thing. And in that weird way, I appreciate that. But still, that disconnect of being disabled was kind of weird, even in college. Like there were those of us who I met who had different disabilities. Some of them were wheelchair users. Some of them were blind, low vision. But we are always kind of disconnected from my disability because, it's, because again, it was about the medical aspect of it. You know, what common, what accommodations did you need and so forth like that. So it really wasn't until I came to this work that I'm like, wow, disability is an identity like my Blackness. There's a history there. There's a culture, there's subcultures. And also it allowed me to be proud pride for uh, my not apparent disability. I'm someone who's hard of hearing. You know, I've been diagnosed since I was 13. And about half of us with my disability tend to have hard of hearing, become hard of hearing over time. And so it wasn't until I started to see more uh, hard of hearing deaf representation where I was like, oh, you know, this is a part of my disability identity as well. Not just the what people can see on the outside of me being under four feet tall in this wheelchair, but also my heart and hearing as well. And getting acclimated to that space too, like learning things and so forth. So my disability identity has been this, you know, another evolution of myself to really see all the connecting dots of what makes me me and to be prideful in that. And I think that this work has been a saving grace for that so that I can see myself whole and not this fragmented, you know, person that other people have kind of placed me in these different boxes and different expectations. So, you know, to the point that you're saying, you know, when I meet other Black disabled folks, especially who are like me, who may have been disabled their whole life and never made the connection or may be newly disabled is trying to figure out how do I navigate this new identity, this new world, you know, I do have a compassion for them, you know, and I'm okay. Like, it's okay if you don't self-identify. Like, I didn't get here overnight. Don't expect me to get here overnight, mm -hmm. you know, and to give them that space because people need that space, you know, not, you know, even if we've been in these disabled bodies, you know, if these are the experiences that we know, there's still so much to learn. And I think that's some of my frustrations of being a part of this community is that we don't give people the space to learn about their disabilities, about their disabled bodies, and also allow that learning to grow as they grow, or as their disabilities change their quality of life or the things that they're able to do. You know, so I think that my story is just, you know, one of many of us, you know, who come into this space, not knowing, but then find a community. And honestly, Black disabled women, when I started this work, 
what's the saving grace of that? Like they're finding me like, oh my gosh, it's so nice to meet someone who's doing this work. And I'm like, girl, I'm figuring this out as much as you are. <laughs> but, you know, but it really made me see the importance of this work and the importance of this space that we create for ourselves as Black disabled women in films to really be the models that we didn't have. You know, as grown women in films, we are the models that we wish that we had when we were young girls. And I think that's a very powerful thing that we don't really talk about a lot, you know, and how it, you know, why it matters to make that community intentionally, make that community with each other mm -hmm. and to still learn and grow, you know, before we um, hopped on the um, webinar, you know, we was discussing, you know, Raven, who's a Black disabled, a Black deaf film, who's on a Netflix show, and seeing people like her and other Black disabled, I'm saying Black deaf women films, particularly since the pandemic, you know, had this surgence of Black deaf representation you know, it's so powerful. And it's one of the things that I didn't realize that I needed until I started to see them. Yeah. So, you know, this evolution of identifying is still growing for me, you know, just as it is with the work. And it's something that, you know, I am more intentional about creating safe spaces for us to have those tough conversations about what does it mean to be in these you know, bodies and understand ourselves in a more intimate way. Because there is an intimacy, you know, that's involved in understanding your Black disabled self. Absolutely. Yeah, and I think for me, in the interviews that I did and coming into community, a big part of it was, I don't want to phrase this, like, understanding that my internalized like racist classist stuff about work as hard as you can don't ask for help right which later I understand was also internalized ableism mm -hmm. like seeing the connections between that and seeing the ways that of course all disabled people experience this kind of thing but the additional layer that race put onto that for me the additional way that I felt like especially as a black woman in the academy I was like I can't ask for accommodations in grad school I can't I have to be 15 steps ahead of everybody else if I want to make it here you know so I mean the coincidence of timing of me doing this project as I was getting tenure right where I finally felt like there was some care some some security also allowed me to then lean into like actually I'm going to start wearing a heating pad on pain days when I teach. I'm gonna start canceling class or now teaching online when I have days that I'm really struggling to get out of the house, but I can give you one hour if I don't have to also shower and drive and do all the other yes. things, right? Uh, it's really given me some permission to lean into what I need and realize actually how disabled I am and how much I was probably making myself more disabled, right, by right. denying those things, because I could push through, right, that pop, that difference between, like, for me, I would always thought about, like, needs and desires, things that I'm like, I would like that, but I don't know if I need it, like, I, I will be okay, I will survive without it, and pushing back against that mentality was a really important part of coming into disability identity um, alongside community, yeah. Um, I want to, can you talk a little bit about Harriet Tubman Collective? Because I think um, one of the things that we've talked about is like that kind of bridge work, you know, mm -hmm. um, and I think that Harriet Tubman is a great, the collective is a great example of that bridge work, but also the, what do I want to call it? like everybody's going to get called out, right? It's not yes. just critiquing white disability community. It's also turning to moving for Black lives. I mean, yes. like, what are you doing? 
Yes. What are you, you know, so can you talk about that work of really being critical of both communities while trying to do the bridge? Yes. I think that with the Heritage Collective, it was one of the first examples of calling out Black spaces for their ableism and erasure. You know, as you were saying, you know, we're really good at calling out the white folks in the <laughs> white organizations, as we should be, <laughs> you know, due to the harm and the privileges that they, you know, intentionally fail to recognize. But I think that we also have to hold our own accountable because, like, you know, myself and many other Black stable folks say, there is no safe space for us. We are not safe in the Black spaces. It's like we're not safe in the disability spaces. And, you know, it's a very delicate dance of calling out Black organizations because we don't want to, you know, if you know how we are in the Black community, we don't want to put our business out there on front street. Mm -hmm. Particularly when we know that white folks, disabled or not disabled, would be nosy and messy about it. And so... And calling out organization like Move for Black Lives, and they're not the only ones who have failed Black disabled people. But for that moment, you know, it was a very powerful moment of being like, hey, you're not going to ignore us. You say you want to be a part of this space of, you know, supporting and uplifting Black people, then we are Black people. We are the Black people you need to remember. And we're going to make sure that you don't forget us and that you're going to be intentional about the work that you do. And a lot of these organizations still are not doing what they need to do. And so for folks like that was within the Heritage and Collective and those outside of that space, you know, we still carry the burden of calling out these organizations and holding them accountable. You know, it's really wild to me, particularly you know, since I have been doing my work with Rampier Voice for a time since the pandemic, how a lot of these Black spaces fail to recognize that there are disabled people within them. The cognitive dissonance is real. You know, like, it's particularly when you are doing work that could either create a disability or exaggerate disability, particularly if you are boots on the ground, you know, doing protests, you know, doing marches and so forth to where Acts of violence can occur, particularly if you have very aggressive police force present. And it makes me think about how a lot of our leaders of the civil rights generation, the civil rights era, maybe think about like, who could they talk to? Mm -hmm. You know, if they if they were disabled, you know, before they started doing this work and or became disabled or had their disabilities exacerbated due to the work. And I think that's what it always brings me back to. How can we break this cycle of not just the erasure of disability, but being intentional about how we talk about it? You know, we have this great distance of of understanding disability as a people. And I think when I go into these spaces of talking to these organizations, I see that conflict there. Like they know what they're not doing is a problem. They don't know what to do to make it right. And I'm like, particularly now, you have all this information literally at your fingertips. I know when I started doing this work, it was it's only like a needle in a haystack to find intersectional pieces intersectional work. I know you can relate to that too, you know, as academic, you know, people were just starting to really come up with, um, you know, discrete, you know, things that nature, those bodies of work. And it's like, you have all this, what are you doing? Why aren't you doing this? And I just think that it boils down to the ableism that exists in our spaces, sometimes internalized ableism of folks not knowing what to say language, you know, fell in to get it wrong. I'm like, you're going to get it wrong before you get it right. And that's what I tell them, like, you have to be comfortable with not knowing what you realize you don't know and messing up. And there are people whose egos are way too big for either one of those. And that really keeps these Black progressive organizations from not being as progressive as they need to be. 
particularly when when you look at the statistics on any of the issues that they care about, police brutality, state violence, education, health care. Well, I have to say what well, people and those of, and other groups of color are significantly disadvantaged. So how can you feel about Black liberation and Black empowerment if you're not even self-aware enough to realize that there's a huge segment of the Black population who is getting it way worse than anybody else? And I think that is the call out that is needed for Black organizations that if you're really going to be about empowering Black people, your failure on disability issues is a grievance that you have to correct to be taken seriously. And a lot of them should not be taken seriously because they're still not doing what they need to do. You know, even if they may engage with the heritage collectives or those who, you know, being comp, um, who are consultants like myself or trainers and things of that nature, they're still not doing what they need to do to ensure that their messaging, the way they engage with the community is on point and are open to learning and growing. And it really makes me see how the movements, you know, disability movement and racial justice, civil rights, you know, Black liberation, you better understand the separations of the groups. You know, when you realize that people just don't talk, people just be in their own bubble, they be so siloed. And it's like, if we came together and learn from each other and then band together to push back on the systemic barriers, we would be a force to be reckoned with. But we have to let go of our own ignorance and ego and inability to sometimes see ourselves within these issues, you know, to really come together. So I think that, you know, the Heritage Collective was one of the first acts of getting these groups, you know, in the words of Beyonce, information, <laughs> you know, getting them information and getting them, you know, in tune with like, hey, you're missing a huge part of the Black population, particularly when we make up some of the highest numbers of disability. And I think that what I found in being in these spaces is that, you know, as always, Black women in films, we get it because many of us are disabled, you know, and we're trying to find language about that. And so I found that many of them are the ones who are willing to get it wrong before they get it right, who are more comfortable with that. You know, because they understand that, hey, there's a lot of experiences that you have that other people intentionally don't know. So let me be intentional about knowing what I don't know and trying to be a better um, comrade in this work. And also that empowers me to be comfortable with my Black disabled body that I have had this separation from. So I think that, you know, since you know, the creation of Harriet Tubman Collective, I've just been seeing a lot of these Black movement spaces, particularly led by Black women films, be more open to not just being called out, but actually figuring out how can we be more inclusive of the work that is needed from accessibility standpoints to bringing in folks to ensuring that the topics and issues that we care about, we do have a disability lens within that. So even in the seven or so years of the creation of Heritage Collective, there has been some movement to these organizations getting getting on point, but there's still a tremendous a lot of work to be done. Really? Yeah. There's still a lot of work to be done. And I think a lot of it is a need for education, a need for slowing down yes some creativity right a lot of times I hear barriers around finances that I'm like can we get a little creative can we think outside the box and I write a little bit about this in the conclusion of the book about what was happening here during the uprisings that you know the pandemic is terrible COVID is terrible I wish it had never happened and it was the first time I saw what I perceived to be really 
disability aware inclusion in our protest work because people were bringing masks to protests. Yep. People were figuring out how to do car protests so that we could social distance and not be all up on each other. We were encouraging each other to go get tested between protests, right? There was this real awareness of we want to be out here. We need to be out here, right? And I still feel like it was some of the most cathartic things to be yeah. in these group spaces in that moment, especially after so much isolation, right? Um, and I, I tried to document that as much as I could, the ways that what we were doing was ultimately like disability justice and care work. And I really want us to not lose that. The next time things pop up, because, you know, they're going to pop off again. That's just right. what it is to be Black in America, like... I think I just finally put away some of my protest supplies that I was like, I guess it doesn't need to be immediately in my closet, ready to go in any minute right. <laughs> right now, which it was for a while. I was just like ready to go. Um, I want to see us hold on to that. You know, I want us to continue to be creative and be explicit because I understand sometimes a long protest where you're going to sit and block off a portion of the city for hours is the method. It is the approach, but that's not for everybody. Right. And that's okay. It's okay to have different methods that aren't for everybody for a variety of reasons, but being really clear and explicit about that so that you don't have folks who have marched two miles with their kids. Now they're two miles from their car and we're going to sit here for four hours and there's no food and there's no water. That's, that's not going to work for so many of us. We're actually putting ourselves at risk. So really thinking about care within organizing work is something that I saw come across much more clearly to me in 2020. And it completely changed. I mean, it changed the book for me. Um, it made me want to write the book more directed at activists. Um, it's when I decided I wanted the book to be open access. Um, and it's when I ad added all those praxis interludes to speak directly to this is what we can learn from this history here's how we can take this and practically use it in our work right now whether you are an organizer a cultural worker an artist how do you bring this into your work to hold an awareness of disability um so I'm really hoping you know folks pick up on that um but also, I think there's so much internalized ableism still. I think there are a lot of Black activists who are disabled. Oh, yes, they are. There are a lot of Black activists who have anxiety and depression and PTSD, right? Like, significantly. Yes. I think about all my friends who were in the street watching their friends get hit by police and gassed and pulled away into cars and then just missing for hours or days until they finally show up in the system to find out which station they're at mm -hmm. there's a lot of trauma there's a lot of trauma that I think people push through because we have this vision of the strong black woman strong black whoever mm -hmm. protester and organizer who holds it down for the community without actually taking care of ourselves and so I think that that's something that disability justice can bring to our movement work is to be like it's okay. Like if you are traumatized because the last time you were doing this, your friend got injured or you got injured or whatever happened to you, you don't have to be in the streets this time. There are other ways for you to contribute to the work and not, you know, exacerbate your disability symptoms. Um, so I hope that folks are like getting that. And you know, I spent a bunch of time in the book talking about disability identity um, from all these interviews, right? Because I do think that more of us need to come into some recognition of the various ways that we're disabled and then, yeah, bring that creativity. Because I think disability community is like the most creative community in terms of just figuring things out. We just figure okay. it out, Definitely. you know? Yeah. Yeah, I think that to the point you're making, yeah, there's many folks in these spaces who are disabled, you know, and they have a lot of hidden disabilities. And I feel like the disabilities are hidden or not apparent or invisible, whatever wording that you want to use. I think sometimes the hesitation to claim disability is to not be believed. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that when 
if people cannot quote unquote see your disability, they question it. And as black folks, you know, we are questioned about everything. Just breathe too hard. You question about why you breathe so hard. You know, anything that we do. So I think that hesitation is real. You know, and I think that's something that I tell people all the time. I'm like, it's okay. Like, whether you have an official diagnosis, whether you are self-diagnosed, whether you have been disabled your whole life, whether or not you just found out at two o'clock a day that you have a disability, it still matters. It still matters. You don't have to prove that. But we live in a society where people have to prove their disability to be believed. And you know, that goes back to accommodation requests and people trying to understand your disability. So we have this weirdness of folks pushing away because their disability may not be believed, their disability may not manifest in quote unquote typical ways that it does. And also wondering, would I be believed if I ask for this type of support? You know, so I think that's a lot of fear of it. And just people just not wanting to add one more black, you no, know, one more thing to that black, you know. Um, deck of cards, you know, and that resistance in that way of being stubborn, you know, being scared. Like, what does it mean to self-identify as disabled? How would people look at me, particularly when you are considered a leader? You know, we don't, you know, it's that internalized ableism of not wanting to look weak, not wanting to look frail, you know, whatever your negative connotation that we have, you know, that's real too, particularly when you're in spaces where ego is real. You know, let's not act like, you know, you dealing with these spaces. There's not a hierarchy of who's important and who's seen and who's this and who's that. And if you are in a space that has, you know, downplayed disability, then you don't want to look like the only one, you know, out here waving a disabled flag, you know, when there are other people who should be waving there with you. So I get in many ways why in Black spaces, and not just Black spaces, you know, it's in other groups as well. But in Black spaces, why we don't want to look a certain way, you know, but that resistance doesn't help anybody. You know, it erases our whole truth and who we are. Like, you know, it shouldn't take us learning about Harriet Tubman as academics or activists. That's, you know, and in relation to her disability or Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, when it comes to her disabilities, you know, that should be common knowledge. But we downplay it because we don't want to seem weak or incapable because it's not just being incapable to us as a community, as a Black community, but also to white folks as well. You know, like white supremacy plays a very big role in our comfortability with self-identifying as disabled or not. So it's a very complicated web here that I think that folks are slowly beginning to detangle and figure out how do I be more comfortable with discussing disability. And for some people, it is ensuring that there is access to on the ground protests or there's many ways that people can engage. It's being open to talk about these things. It's bringing folks in. It's chipping away at the big old wall of ableism in Black movement spaces slowly but surely. But, you know, as I was saying earlier and kind of what you were saying as well, you know, just wondering, like, how did past leaders deal with this? You know, we hear about people, mental illness, you know, you know, as they trek along in their journey in this activism work, we hear about people who lose folks, you know, things of that nature. Like, it always makes you think about who suffer unnecessarily because they could not be truthful about what they needed. And maybe that's the social worker in me who, you know, in thinking that way. But it really does make me think who could have benefited from being in this time to where you could be open about your anxiety, your depression, your PTSD, you know, the other things that you're going through versus you had to keep it quiet due to the way that society looked at mental illness, especially, you know, in the 60s, 70s and 80s when, you know, you could be put away if you talked a little too much or you exhibited behaviors that seemed a little normal. The real fear being institutionalized. So it just really makes me question like, wow, you know, so much could have been different for so many people who we uphold as leaders, you know, and I think that for me, and I'm sure it's certain for you as well, that we really want to change that. So we don't repeat the bad habits of 
the before times, even if we understand why things were the way that they were, they don't have to be that way now. Yeah, I think what you're talking about is really highlighting just how like all mashed up yes. <laughs> all the systems are. You know, the way that respectability comes into play uh, for me, like fat phobia came into play for a long time and how I was resistant to identifying as disabled and accepting, especially physical assistance, because mm-hmm. I was just so afraid of people projecting a bunch of fat phobia onto my yes. body as a result of that. So these systems are so mashed up. Um, but I, I'm also thinking about some things that cause that like result in certain kinds of non-apparent and sight disabilities, I think in black communities get dismissed because they're common, right? Like in 2016, when I was having just off the wall paranoia, um, and especially like if I heard a siren on the radio, if I saw flashing lights anywhere, like my heart was in my throat immediately just so much terror around potential for police violence and there were a lot of black folks that I talked about that they were like well that's just being black in America that's just what it is right and I'm like is it is this we're not we're not all concerned about how much stress and anxiety is happening for all of us right so I think it's easy to dismiss some things as just like that's what it's like to be black. That is what it's like to experience anti-black racism in this country, to live in this country. Um, rather than pointing back and being like, wow, anti-blackness is disabling. Yes. And that's what I think g- gets missing, right? Is that we're critiquing anti-blackness without really talking about its embodied and disabling effects on us um, because folks don't want to position all black people as disabled because of the association with inferiority, right? Rather than being really critical of these systems. Um, I'm also thinking about Huey Newton and the Black Panthers um, who, you know, had a lot going on at the end of his time, including some drug use, but there was definitely some psych stuff going on. Yeah, And some of that was because of the FBI. Yes. (laughs) the federal government was intentionally trying to make people think things were happening that weren't happening, planting moles, like trying to break apart the party in ways that if you were already prone to some kind of psych disability, it was going to amp that up, Yeah, right? If you are watching your friends literally get arrested and killed, how is that not going to harm you? (laughs) How is that not going to be disabling and have these mental effects? And I think we have to think about that with the current movement work because, uh, you know, for me here in Madison, it really felt like we were at war. It really felt like the government and the state was out to get us. You know, there were tanks driving down the middle of the streets in Madison. We had curfews um, and I don't know how else to describe it than feeling like we were at war. You know, I was doing supply runs at night, like in the cover of darkness, trying to bring supplies to different people. And it was like food and water and first aid right. kits. It wasn't like I was like bringing in guns, but it still felt like I was doing something illegal because I was breaking curfew to make sure that folks had what they needed on the ground. Um, and so that, I don't know that a lot of people have had time to process what that did to so many of us to feel really amped up and in the streets all the time and I think people weren't resting enough you know like not taking care of their bodies um so yeah I just think that really making sure we're going back to like some of the sources of this in our community is from anti-blackness it's from racism it's from racial violence it's from state violence and we can still take care of ourselves, right? We don't have to move towards a model of like, now we're all going to be cured, but we can think about what does care look like? What does wellness look like in the context that we have now with the body minds that we have now? Because, you know, as you know, dealing with multiply marginalized communities, we've all got trauma. We've all got so much trauma. Exactly. It is traumatic to be alive in these bodies, <laughs> in this place right it just is um and so really recognizing that and thinking about access um in these like really care-centered ways I think is going to be important as we move forward as a movement I think something that you're 
connecting here just how the trauma that we experience as Black people is deeply rooted in us as a people. It's in our DNA. You know, it's, you know, it's, we carried it on in each generation in different ways. I um, were listening to one of the Black films who's um, big into conscious parenting, just a parenting. And though I myself do not desire to have children, but I always try to keep updated on, you know, how to care for the children that may be in my sphere. And the one point that she was making in an interview that I will listen to today actually was how, you know, our ability to parent Black people have always, who has roots in slavery. Mm-hmm. You know, how sometimes our behavior we have not had a chance to integrate why we carry on certain things that may be harmful within each generation about how we parent and things of that nature. We haven't had the space to interrogate them and then try to do better. You know, our generation is one of the first ones who's trying to unlearn uh, these, you know, parental matters that have not been the healthiest for at least the generation. So in hearing you talk and maybe think about how we have not had a chance as a people to process any of this crap that has happened to us because we've been brought over here. We haven't had a chance to just, there hasn't been a period of time for Black people to sit down and be like, okay, let us talk about what we have been through and how we can get better. We are piecemealing it within each generation as we go. And I think that says a lot about how can we become whole? How can we begin to heal? You know, when you're in a, when you live in a country where you are always constantly at war in some way, shape or form, whether it's on the micro level and you, you know, experiencing microaggressions or just blatant racism in your everyday living to the big stuff that you were talking about with protesting the injustices of these systems. We have not had a chance to breathe and to get the access to resources and support. So the body minds that we have, you know, are susceptible to a lot of things that if we had the space and we had the safety, we could maybe engage with it in a more intentional way. And I think that's also why I give more understanding to us, you know, when we may engage in behavior that may not be favorable. But when you pull back the curtains, there's always connecting dots somewhere, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know, as to why we are the way that we are, how we got here. It's like, oh, that's the moment or moments that has shaped you in the way that you think, in the way that you engage, the way you communicate or don't engage well or communicate well. And I think that's the understanding that for me, disability has allowed me to have this unique understanding of people, of seeing them more than just what they present themselves as, getting deeply under the layer there, you know, in ways that people may not want you to see them. Mm-hmm. But when you get to talk to them, you're like, oh, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. And so I think that being in this country as a people, I just hope one day, I may not see it, that we get a space, get to a space to where Black people, we genuinely get what we need to not just survive, but to thrive. I Many of us are in survival mode every day, and particularly as disabled folks. You know, some of us are truly in survival mode because we don't have access to financial resources. You know, we can barely get our care taken care of for the access things that we need from there. We are literally in survival mode, but what does it look like for Black people, all of us, to be thriving? What does that look like? And I hope that one day, at least one generation far out, get to thrive, get the healing and the care that they need in this country. And I think that our generation, generation coming after us, I think we're slowly getting it together. But, you know, I look at my grandmother's upbringing, my mother's upbringing, particularly those who I know who have mental illness, like, I understand how they are the way they are. Mm -hmm. You know, when you listen to people's stories and you're like, oh, that's the moment. And I just, I want Black people to find community 
that allows them to heal and to be seen in full and to be loved and to have a softness, you know, to where they don't have to be hard or hardened by this world who that they are in constant battle with every day. And I think that's, I think that's the reality that has really been made plain to me in being in this work that we don't catch a break and it is literally sometimes killing us because we don't. And how do we save those of us who are barely hanging on? I know we have to go to questions, but I just want to mark that, you know, I think what you just did um, is like one of those qualities that I identify in the book that Black disability politics is historicized and contextualized, that part of the work is constantly being like part of the reason it happens in this way in Black communities is because of all this other stuff that goes back so far. Yes, that we have to pay attention to. Um, Once I got a question about like why there weren't more um, Black disabled folks in like the early disability rights movement. And I'm like, the early disability rights movement came from folks who came from economic and racial privilege, whose parents were able to fight for them to get into the schools. Parents who, moms who literally carried kids upstairs because there was no wheelchair access and they were able to do that. How many Black parents were able to be stay-at-home parents to be able to take their kids and fight for them to get the education they needed to be able to go to the college, to get the, you know, like all these things that we have to go back to understand. It wasn't just that Black disabled people were like, no thanks. (laughs) That's not what's happening. So that that historicized and contextualized part is just, it's just so important. And I think it it is very much part of the political work we need to be like let's let's scale back to understand how we got here in the first place rather than what I think sometimes happen is just like blaming black disabled people for not like being up to date on what's currently happening in certain relatively educationally privileged spaces yeah and you know what you're saying made me think about what my grandmother would say to me she was like children like you didn't go to school you know and she meant black disabled children because she knew the white and say with kids, you know, at least maybe up north, those who had resources, like you were saying, they went to school somewhere, show how. But folks like us, you know, in rural South Carolina, especially, we weren't going to schools. You know, you think I was going to be willing miles and miles alone as a little black girl in the 30s, 40s, and 50s? They know. We stayed at home, you know, and being told that because she was speaking the truth that she knew, you know, from her upbringing. It made me realize the privilege that I have today. And I think that hearing those stories made me value the education I was able to give, able to receive. And my grandmother was very adamant about me getting my education. You know, she wasn't versed on the laws, but she knew I needed to be at school. She knew I had a right to be at school and she didn't play, (laughs) you know? And, And I think that's the understanding as well. Sometimes, we as a people, we may not always have the language for certain things, but we understand the systems at play for those of us who live differently. And I think, you know, in here you talk about that, you know, we have to be realistic about what were the opportunities for Black folks in the 50s and 60s when the movement started to begin. You know, that was when the Brown versus Board of Education, you know, colleges were still being segregated, just slowly getting into integration. So I think that we cannot lose an understanding of what were the realities for Black people in general, but particularly this particular segment of Black folks and access and who was able to do what with the limited resources that was available and why. All right. You want to look at some of these questions? Yes. Um, let's just start with the first one. Um, so Rosalind Denise Campbell, um, yes. at the beginning was talking about the, emo- the introductions, making them emotional, um, and having always struggled with mental health issues, um, but did not expect to start suffering from physical issues, um, and says they're using the term struggled and suffering intentionally mm-hmm. because that is their experience, um, 
and had the intention of making huge impact in Black mental health and have done to an extent, but now it's on hold due to physical illnesses, which have become disabilities. So the question is, as someone new to this community, how do you continue to do the work when your body and sometimes your mind, emotional, spiritual self will not allow you? Do you want to take that? Because I know, especially since you're a scope of academia, how do you combat that? I mean, I have been really working on this myself as someone who loves to throw myself into a project until I can't do it anymore. But um, when we really love, learn- stay busy. Yes. You know, really <laughs> learning how to listen to my body, how to build in rest, Um, I just finished the Rest is Resistance Manifesto um, by Trisha Hershey. That book was really great for me. Um, And I think similar to pleasure activism, which which has been um, really shaping my, my work in the last couple of years, it helps me personally as someone who (laughs) was raised in a Christian background. And I think sometimes transmute that, uh, Mm-hmm. energy of service to the Lord and to service of <laughs> social justice. Yes. <laughs> I just like moved it over here a little bit. Um, and I've had to be like, okay, my pleasure is political. So when I, I invest in my pleasure, that is also still contributing to the movement. My rest is political. So when I rest, it is still contributing. It helps me. It helps my brain at least to really like frame it that way. Um, and being in community helps because when I know that there are other people who also can do the work, it allows me to be like, it's not all on me. I know there are other people doing this. And when those people want to rest, I want to be able to help them and pick up the slack. And when I want to rest, then that happens. And sometimes everybody want to rest and we just don't do something. And that's sometimes we can't, sometimes we just can't. Um, But I think, you know, especially in light of losing Judy recently and just how many disabled activists and organizers we lose early that are not necessarily always directly about their disabilities, right? Right. Um, It makes me want to really encourage more rest and care in in our movement work. And so for me, it's coming back to that, to be like, it is not all on me. It is not all going to get done today, tomorrow, in my lifetime, in this generation. So I have to contribute what I can in order to sustain myself and know that sustaining myself is part of the work. Um, That if I am unwell, then the work right now is to take care of me, you know, and that's, that's all I can do. Um, and really leaning into that. And again, for me personally, that those books, Pleasure Activism, Rest is Resistance, were really helpful in me being like, okay, even this is part of the work. So slow down and be intentional. Mm-hmm. I say for me, enacting boundaries. You know, a lot of folks, they tell me, you know what, your ability to have boundaries is so you know, inspiring, you know, and I'm like, yeah, I had to learn. <laughs> I had to learn it. You know, I I would say grad school was my experience of really getting into the psychosocial thing. Like my undergrad was psychology and I like psychology, but I feel like social work really helped me connect the dots on what does it mean for me to be in the spaces that I am? How is it serving me? You know, that's where I learned about better communication tools, you know, social work is one of those fields that people don't really understand how you really better engage humans in a more intentional way and how you talk to them, how you think about things, how you go forward. And so even though I'm not doing social work in a traditional sense, I have applied a lot of those things that I learned in my personal life and boundaries was instrumental in that because when you come into a space of disabled folks who don't like to be told no you realize quick boundaries has to become your best friend and you're going to have to be comfortable with people not liking you because you don't do what they want you to do on their timetable 
and saying no and being unapologetic about where I spend my time have both been the saving graces for me to be sustainable in this space, knowing that my passions come first and I cannot put those aside for other people. And that was a great lesson last year that I am deeply applying into this year. And I think that when you book, when you reach a certain profile in these spaces, you learn quickly that if you don't know boundaries, you are going to be pulled in every other direction but where you need to be led. And you're going to be overworked. You're going to be overutilized. And you're going to, in some ways, suffer some abuse in these spaces. Um, because there are a lot of abusers in these spaces. Um, abusers of power and so forth. So for me, boundaries allowed me to be intentional with my time, with what I say yes to, and what I would say no to without hesitation, you know, in knowing when to pass things along to other people. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really helps, especially I came into the space in my 30s. If I had came into the space younger, I would not have had the boundaries that, I had, that I've had to learn to implement over time. You know, and I would have been ran ragged, you know, in this space. But being in my 30s, I know who I am. I know what matters to me. And I'm not, it's always hard up for friendship to where I feel like I have to overextend for people to like me. You know, so being at this age and stage of life, you know, what's the better position for me to be in so that when I met these conflicting personalities and situations I had tools to be able to handle that and to stay firm with what mattered to me and I think that has been this genuinely the saving grace for me to be sustainable and to not hate this work you know because you can really end up hating what you love because you don't fulfill what makes you happy you know this work is hard you know talk about the issues you know whether it's a conversation like this or it's more of a presentation style, it's really hard because you're dealing with a lot of traumatic, negative things. So having boundaries allows me to ensure that I'm able to get some joy in this space and not just get the thorns of the obstacles we talk about or even my own experiences I have to bring up. So for me, boundaries has been instrumental for me to be sustainable here. Mm -hmm. Have you read that uh, Set Boundaries, No Peace book? I have not. Girl, changed my life. My therapist was like, you need to read this. And then I was like, I think that was a read. I think that was shade. And yet it was very helpful. <laughs> it was very helpful. Um, for me, at least as someone that like recognized I needed better boundaries and that book gives you like exact phrases to say that I've like started to incorporate. So if you're someone that's like, maybe get something intellectually, but needs the guide, um, it's the, someone just asked, it's yes. called set boundaries, no peace. I think, um, Nedra Tawab, T-E-W-A-B, um, she's great. And even if you just follow her on Instagram, she yes. always is posting some great stuff. There we go. Set boundaries, no peace. Um, there's a couple of shorter questions I think maybe we can do quickly because yes. the, the questions are piling up. So someone asked about the name of the article you mentioned yes. about children's schools and disability hierarchy. Yes, I'm going to place it in the chat. Um, awesome. I am an op-ed writer for PRISM. So this was one of my pieces that came from watching a conversation on Twitter about adults hating children, which is a reality in this country and how it has recent ableism. And again, one of those threads that go back to slavery, you know, in this country, how we um, treated disabled enslaved children up to now. So um, that's the link that I posted in the chat. So yeah, I connected the historical aspect of enslavement, child labor laws up to what we're dealing with today. We see the policing of children's bodies, you know, and what does that mean when we have a society that does not value the uniqueness of children? 
Um, so there was a question about the Netflix show you mentioned, which was The Circle. It's a reality yes. show on Netflix. Um, and then someone asked a question about representation, what representation means to us, and like the insight of of Raven, like why that was important for us. Um, which for me at least, one, she's just a gorgeous black woman. Yes. And I just love seeing gorgeous black women period end of sentence uh that's all sentence but I think the fact that she was on the show so the premise of the show was like they are all um on like a fake social media site they're in their own little apartments and they're trying to like win each other's approval and some people pretend to be other people and some people are themselves um by creating these profiles and I think that the fact that disability you know, and her signing, but sometimes speaking, right? I think it was just such a realistic and balanced representation that wasn't so focused on disability, which is often how it happens. Um, and I just love the intimacy between her and Paris, um, who is the, the interpreter in the show, but also one of Raven's friends. Um, and Paris is a Black queer man. So there's just, there was something about that very black queer femme yes. way of interacting with each other that I just felt so drawn to um and just was so excited for other people to get to witness it without it being this look at this amazing disabled superhero person you know it wasn't yes. that um she really just got to be herself in with her person you know um so that was that's for me it was why that representation was so important that it was hitting like multiple things at the same time for me yes and for me I just love seeing us do badass things <laughs> you know and for someone like Raven who's younger it's really good to see young disabled deaf folks just do incredible things, things that you may not have thought about doing when you were their age. And just seeing them take control of the narrative or their disabled or deaf identity is really important. And yeah, I just was just great to see someone that I kind of know of from, you know, you know, interactions online to be on this type of show, to get that type of visibility and and knowing that it will be done well, you know, that it won't fall into the phrase and inspiration of porn, like you was hinting at, you know, that this person has a deeply rooted sense of self in their disabled deaf identity and how that glows on screen, you know, for people who may be witnessing that for the first time. And for those of us who, you know, gravitate towards that type of representation, that matters for us to see ourselves just doing ordinary things we always say like saving people out here living our lives this is a part of that some of us get on you know these reality shows and become contestants we do that too so just showing that we are doing everyday things and it's not a big deal you know and to see that our involvement can be accommodated you know in a way that allows us to be powerful and to be intentional in the way that we engage with as well yeah um there's a question here that I want to answer. Um, so it says, how do you make sure to give credit to community and activist communities um, and their work, especially since they're always leaps ahead of academia? Um, how might this look in, in citational practice? And I just, I want to say a little bit about it just because yeah. it was something that I was really grappling with, with this um, book, since it was so much about activists. Um, right. And I'll say from, this was not the vision for the project originally. I, I envisioned something totally different and then I got into the archives and there was so much that I just suddenly had a book and I was like, oops, I guess I wrote this book instead of what I thought it was going to do. I thought it was going to be like one or two chapters, right? But it ended up being almost the whole, you know, almost the whole thing. Um, so some things that I did was, yeah, one, I cite social media posts, I cite blogs, right? It is not just publications that I'm citing. I'm, I'm very intentional about that. Um, naming people as much as possible, um, naming organizations, 
Um, and with consent, you know, when I was talking about the the movement work during the uprisings in 2020, I asked people for ourselves, is it okay to name that you were part of this with me, right? But um, yeah, asking people what they want. Um, and then for me, at least, it has also meant, you know, the open access and events like this. I've been really trying to make sure that as I'm touring with the book, when it is possible to have me in conversation with the activists that I interview, I'm going to do that. Um, so, you know, you came with me to New York, but we also had um, Heather and Patrick come with us um, for the book launch when um, I'm going to be at Winston-Salem. We're going to do a panel together, yes. but then at, I'm also going to be doing, um, oh my gosh, my, I just blanked on her name. It's the end of the day. Oh my gosh. Black autistic talks about being black in autistic communities all the time. And now I'm just blanking on. Oh gosh, she looked, that was the least descriptive. <laughs> I know. I know. Is it Saray? No. Oh Not gosh. Teal. No. Oh gosh. Young, young, like in college, young. I cannot believe this. All right. Well, we're going right. to find that in a minute. Um, I'm so sorry to that person. I keep picturing Kia Brown and it's not Kia Brown, but it's like close. Kayla, Kayla Smith. There okay. it is. Okay. There you go. Yep. 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 Kayla Smith. Yes. Um, so we're going to do a panel together at Salem College. So that has also been part of it, um, both to uplift people, but also get them paid. I'm trying to get people paid. Yes. So if I can do that, that, so that's my answer to this question of like, it looks what it looks like in citational practice, but also in how I promote and talk about the book. Um, I think we're close to the end of time, but I wonder if we want to wrap up with this question of what self-care practice do you wish you knew about five years ago? I don't say necessarily what I knew about, but what I did better at implementing. Because I think we know a little bit about self-care, like what makes us feel good. But I think that's something that I've been intentional about this year, ironically, has been logging off. Logging off social media. <laughs> I, you know, realize that you don't have to be plugged in all the time mm -hmm. and I think we all can take an assessment of if I am plugged in all the time how does that make me feel does it make me anxious does it make me tired you know if I'm doom scro scrolling you know is that helping me or hurting me you know so I think that we all can take a little bit of an assessment as to how much of our social media consumption is harming us or helping us and if it's doing a former, if it's harming us, what can we do? Again, boundaries, you know, and sometimes some rewarding as well. What can we do to ensure that we're able to be still plugged in to the things that matter to us, but we also enjoy a life that is not on our phones and tablets and other electronics? Um, I would agree with that. I sometimes have whole weekend days or a whole night where I put my phone on silent on do not disturb yes. in another room where I can't see it, touch it, nothing, none of it. Um, because yeah, I need to protect access to me at times and my access to the world that is overwhelming. Um, that happened a lot for me, you know, whenever there's another murder of a black person. Sometimes I just put my phone away because yes. I can't be in the thick of it. I can't, I can't, I have to take a breath. Yes. Um, but another practice that, you know, I think is kind of specific to me, but um, this year, what I've been doing with traveling because you know, traveling right now is still high risk. Um, and I'm trying to really be intentional about you know, the tour is half in person, half virtual, that when I do go in person somewhere, I have built in a rest day. So I ask people to pay for at least one extra night in the hotel so that I get a day in wherever I am that I can do whatever I want. Yes. And if I'm in high pain, that might mean I'm in a hotel room all day long, ordering food to the room and watching cable. <laughs> 
or I'm going to a museum or whatever it is, but I get, I built in rest and pleasure so that I kind of get a mini me day, a mini vacation day inside of the tour. Um, and that has been so good. It has been so good to just not run my mind and my body so ragged. Yes. You know, I used to do these trips where I would fly in the night before, give a talk, fly out right away the next morning, you know, just really, really fast. And now I get to be in a space for a little longer and yeah, find a little joy. You know, I was in Baltimore on a day where it was randomly 77 degrees, which terrifying, but it meant that I got to go eat outside by the water in the sun. And it was so good for my body and my mind as someone who really struggles with seasonal depression and lives in Wisconsin. Um, so yeah, that is something that I've started to do is figure out like, if I'm, even though this is a work thing, how can I work in a little me time, a little pleasure time into this? Um, and that is something that I didn't give myself permission to do prior to this year. Yes. Thank you all so much. This was really moving and important and beautiful. We had people tuning in from all over, from uh, the Bahamas and Oakland and Florida and Chicago and Philadelphia and Detroit and LA and Madison. It's just been really fabulous. So thank you, Bailosa. Thank you, Sammy. Thank you, Brandon. And thank you, Juana. This was just really a very special evening. And Texas, and something we will uh, all remember and be processing for a really long time. So I'm very grateful. I know all the people who stayed with us were, and uh, wish everybody a very good and restful rest of the evening. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Jill.